Good evening and welcome to those of you who are watching us online and to those of you who are present with us in person. Uh, we're going a little old school with the technology online uh, and old school because we're making use of our paperworks this evening for our worship together. We'll be using uh, our ELW responsive prayer, some of which you may know by heart, others of which you might not follow along as you can. As always, even in this time when maybe things are a little less hectic, school is done for most of us. I think Friday is the last for Iowa City. Summer is here and there's a little bit of a it's still good in this middle of the week to take a moment and just breathe before we get started. And so in our breathing, we're going to breathe in through the nose. We expand out and then out through the mouth. And we just relax, maybe kind of get ourselves settled into this place and this time and focused on this time together and with God. And so we'll breathe deeply three times and then I'll get us started. So we breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. We breathe in through the nose, be still. And out and know that I am God. We breathe in again and out. We begin on the side of your sheet that says ELW Responsive Prayer. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with the dialogue on the back. Show us your mercy, O God, and grant us your salvation. Give us the joy of your saving help again, and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Give peace in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Keep the nations under your care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and sustain me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come before you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, we give you thanks for blue sky, for sun, and warmth that brings growth to plants around us. Maybe a little more rain would be nice. We give you thanks for this opportunity to pause in this evening time of summer. The sun is still warm around us, still things to do and see. And in this moment, we pray that you would open our eyes to see your truth in these texts before us. Open our ears to hear them our hearts to understand them and move our feet that we might go and do them. 
We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. So I have two texts today. The one is a poem, and it's from Ezekiel. The other is the Gospel text from Mark. And the Ezekiel text says this. It's Ezekiel 17, begins with the 22nd verse. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. Our gospel text is from the fourth chapter of Mark. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain on the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can nest in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. So what do we do with these texts? The first one might seem a little odd to us, but let me put some context to it. The cedars of Lebanon are an image that is often used in Hebrew scripture for something that is mighty and everlasting. The cedar tree is something then that the Jews linked to their national identity. The context for this poem of Ezekiel is the context of the exile, which shaped and changed the Jewish understanding of their faith. It is something that overshadows large portions of the Old Testament. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had ordered King Zedekiah, the Jewish king, blinded and deported to Babylon. He executed all of Zedekiah's heirs. He tore down the walls of Jerusalem, flattened the temple, seeking to destroy any sort of hope the Jews might have of a return. Any hope they might have had that their God still stood with them. The temple was the visible sign of God's presence among them. The Holy of Holies was any place on earth that you could point to and say, that's where God is. They could say that at that place. It was gone. They no longer, the Jewish elite, were taken away and put into a foreign land, the covenant God made with Abraham, that they would have this land as an eternal holding, was broken. What did that mean? What do they do now? 
the understanding was when you fought another people, it wasn't just your troops and their troops fighting each other, but your God fighting their God. Because what did you do? You each prayed to your God for victory. And so obviously the more powerful God brought about victory. It was Yahweh defeat by the Babylonian God. Was the covenant still in effect? What was going on? As they sat in Babylon and wondered, they began to remember the prophets that had come and warned them if they didn't straighten up and fly right. Bad things were going to happen. There were consequences for the decisions that they made. Other gods that they had worshipped, not caring for the ones whom God had said they needed to care for widows, orphans, foreigners in their midst. And in this particular poem, it begins to talk about what they understood God was doing. God taking the top of a giant cedar tree, planting it somewhere that it does not belong on a mountaintop. Mountains are understood to be the place that you go to be close to God. Israel, or Jerusalem itself, is built on a, on a, a plain, a mountain. You literally go up to Jerusalem. You'll hear that language often in Scripture. You go up to Jerusalem. It doesn't matter whether you're north or south. Why? Because you literally go up to Jerusalem. They've been planted elsewhere, but God is the one who is doing the planting. And it will prosper. As one author points out in this text, God is about inverting expectations. What they had looked at as defeat Defeat for God was actually a way in which God was working still. And there was promise still, even in the midst of what looked like defeat. Exile. There would still be bad times to come, but the promise was God was planting a new thing and the promise was still intact. God was still their God. We have a similar kind of thing going on in these texts from Mark. Planting texts. The guy goes out and sows seed. Uh, another translation of the text would be, in this manner the reign of God is, as if a man would throw seed on the earth. The reign of God is like this. Guy throws seed on the earth, he goes about his business and kind of wakes up and says, oh look, something has sprouted. The next one, Jesus says, the kingdom of God, the reign of God is like a mustard seed. And the word here for seed is something a little different. Spore might be a little better way of putting it. it it's not your typical word that's used in mustard seed, the language that's used for that plant, it's often considered to be a weed, even in that day and age. It's sown on the ground. It's the smallest of seeds, and it is. If you've ever seen a, a, what a mustard seed looks like, it's really tiny. And yet when it's sown, what does it become? Now, the, the author, uh, you know, Jesus exaggerates a little. The greatest of all shrubs puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. That language harkens back to this language of Ezekiel, right? The cedars of Lebanon provide this shelter. This little mustard seed, which is the rain of God, provides shelter. It's a little thing that suddenly becomes really big. A seemingly insignificant thing that becomes this greatest of all shrubs.
But what do we do with these texts? God inverts our expectations. God active in ways we can't expect or see. And God acting in ways that we don't control, but we're part of. The reign of God happens, is planted, is sown, as we go about our ordinary day. This guy, we don't even know if he's a farmer. It's just some scattered seed. And then he goes about his business, sleeps and rises, night and day, time passes. And suddenly there's something there. A little insignificant seed planted in the ground. Suddenly there's something there. The rain of God happens. Parents as you go about your lives. Making breakfast, getting them to school, getting them back, taking them to practice, while you're at practice, while you're in the car. It happens in the everyday, in the little conversations, in the little interactions. Very rarely is it certainly for most of their lives, in long conversations or teaching sessions, right? It happens as these seeds get dropped, little limit things get dropped throughout their lives. Things you may not even remember, but that will stick in their minds. Just like there are things that were significant to you in, in the life with your parents, I don't know about you, I've shared some of those, and my, my mother has said, I don't have any recollection of that at all. But it was important to me. It's in those moments, those little seeds, that the reign of God happens in their lives. The reign of God happens, people of God, on your commutes, when you cut the grass, when you wash the dishes. It's planted as you speak with coworkers and as you watch movies. One author wrote, the reign of God is something you sow inadvertently and it grows while you are busy going about your business. We sow seeds all the time. What seeds are we sowing? Are they the reign of God seeds? Seeds that will bring life? Fuller and more abundant seeds that speak for widows and orphans, the most vulnerable, for the foreigners who are in our midst? Or are they seeds that will bring destruction? Seeds of hate or fear? As another author put it, while we seek to be aligned with God and God's mysterious work, we know that it is ultimately God's work, not ours, right? He doesn't know how it grows. It grows by its own process. A process that God created. One that we are in the midst of now. Corn loves the heat, but it's going to need some rain soon, right? We can't provide we can tend to it, we can sow it, we can perhaps feed it a bit, but ultimately it's God's work. But we are called to be laborers, to sow the seed, but also to reap the harvest. To see where this reign of God has popped up in other people. To be attentive. And so this is what I will be, 
Hungary. For the rest of this week, I think. What it means to plant seeds for the reign of God, what expectations do I have that God is in birth? Where are things that seem like they are hopeless that perhaps God is at work in that? What things seem small and insignificant, but actually they are the seed for something big? But also to understand, I may not notice it. Not at first. And also that it is not solely my responsibility. I had a conversation with um, one of my in-laws, and as we were talking about um, our duty towards those who are not followers of Jesus, and she has a great passion for that, and I admire that, but as a Christian who happens to be Lutheran, I also have an understanding from Luther's explanation of the third article of the Creed, which is our duty and responsibility is so to sow the seed. Our duty and responsibility is not to make it grow. We cannot faith give someone faith. We can proclaim and trust that the Spirit will act in and through that word. We can live out in front of them as much as we can our understanding of the reign of God and what that looks like. But ultimately, it's the Spirit's work, it's God's work to transform someone else's life. The seed grows. We don't know how. All we're called to do is sow it. And trust that God will work in God's own time. Which, to me, is actually a great relief. I can sow the Word. I can do that. I can attend to another. I can care for them, love them in the way that God has loved me. I can do that. And I'll leave the rest up to God. The God who I know is merciful and kind and just. The one who hangs with God's people even though they turn from God one who takes a sprig and puts it on a mountaintop and says, I will make of you a great seed. So, I would invite us to be attentive to all those places where we are planting seeds. And at least ask the question, what kind of seeds are we planting? Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously protected us today. We ask you to forgive us all our sins where we've done wrong, and graciously to protect us tonight. Into your hands we commend ourselves, our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. An invitation for all to join us uh, this Sunday, 9 o'clock a.m. here at the church. We'll have... Communion, which we will serve uh, in uh, our worship together, will also be online, I uh, get it, 9 o'clock. Uh, our uh, Adventures with Flat Jesus uh, have started. Uh, I know Flat Jesus made a trip to Ohio because I ran into him there. I have not posted my pics yet. That is my bad. But we encourage you uh, to take Flat Jesus with you wherever you go. Snap some pics with Flat Jesus doing whatever it is, baseball or swimming 
or parks or biking, uh, post uh, those pics to uh, our Facebook page or uh, use a hashtag, send them to us, and we'll share those throughout the summer to see where Jesus will be. A reminder that our Vacation Bible School registration has opened. You'll find links to that in our e -news. On our website, also at the top of our Facebook page, we encourage you to sign up and join us for that. Uh, and we also continue to uh, look for folks who are willing to help us uh, in terms of volunteering for that, but also in our worship time together, and you can find links to all of those in those same places. So, uh, I uh, send you forth into the rest of this evening. Uh, stay cool, and please do join us again on Sunday morning. God's blessings and good night.